Uh, good morning, participants. Uh, our program will start in a few minutes. Uh, we are waiting for the panelists to join. Within uh, two to three minutes, we can start the program. Namaskar, sir. Namaskar, Dilon, sir. Sir, am I adverb? Dilon, sir. Sir, am I audible, sir? Oh, yes, very much. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, with your permission, we are starting the program now. Yeah. Uh, Namaskar and good morning. On behalf of National Institute of Disaster Management, I, Harihar Kumar, Ang Professional, Center for Coastal Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience, welcome you all. For the second day of three days training online training program on flood risk management organized by national Institute of disaster management in collaboration with Ursachet disaster management authority so before moving to the today's session uh, we quickly recapitulate the estimated training session what we learned yesterday and then uh, what are the main aspects we can we uh, empowered like we highlighted by our uh, panelists and our subject experts so uh, in yesterday's session, we learned about what are the basic disaster management technologies and concepts and like what are the different phases of disaster management cycle. And also we learned about vulnerability profile of India, like what are the different type of hazards which are prone to uh, Indian uh, geography and uh, particularly related to flood, what kind of uh, impact it can show on uh, our communities and our people. Uh, in our session, uh, in the second session, we, we heard about we learned uh, what the concept of climate change and how it is impacting the disaster profile, particularly related to flood in Indian context by Sri Anil Kumar. So uh, today uh, we are having a, a three sessions. The first session will be uh, on flood assessment. So, so uh, for the first session today, we have joined with Sri uh, Manjit Singh Dillon. So before uh, passing on the stage to Sri Manjit Singh uh, Dillon, I would like to give a brief introduction to our uh, about our uh, subject experts to our participants. So uh, Sri Manjit Singh Dillon is a 1983 batch officer of Central Water Engineering Services. And before becoming a chairman of Ganga Flood Control Commission on 16 September 2019, he has worked as a chief engineer in performance overview and management improvement organization as well as in flood management organization of CWC New Delhi. And uh, he was involved with uh, like in numerous aspects of uh, appraisal of flood protection schemes, flood forecasting and flood modeling for the whole of India. He has experience in the realms of hydro civil designs, barrages and canal designs, monitoring irrigation projects, appraisal of water resources, hydrometeorological investigators, and hydrological uh, observations. He has also worked as a director in the thermal civil designs wing of Central Electricity Authority. And he has, he has also been a member of numerous committees and professional organizations in the area of water resources. So it's my great pleasure to welcome on this uh, 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 training program for, your, for such a... <coughs> Excuse me, sir. 
uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you on board for your address to uh, for your special uh, session on flood assessment to our participants. Welcome you, sir. Welcome you on board. Well, uh, can I start? Sir? Yes, sir. You can start. Okay. Thank you very much, and greetings to all from uh, Ganga Control Commission. And uh, it's my my uh, it's my honor to uh, that you give me a chance to speak on floods. Uh, floods have been uh, my favorite for the last four and a half years. I have been working as chief engineer in flood management organization in Central Water. And uh, dealing with flood forecasting, flood modeling, as you said, and uh, uh, for all over India, but they are in that the Ganga and Brahmaputra basin being uh, some big basins. They have been uh, given separate organizations to and to, and the DSCC is for Ganga basin states. There are eleven states among the Ganga basin in DSCC. and uh, another organization is Brahmaputra board that is for the Brahmaputra river. Uh, I, I shall I start my uh, presentation? Yes. Yes, sir. You can start the presentation. I have given the right to uh, share the screen also. Uh, sir, uh, in the top uh, corner, there will be a share option. Is there? Yes, so, uh, meanwhile, I request all the participants to actively participate in this training program and then raise their queries in the chat box so that our su uh, subject experts will uh, answer those queries by our participants at the end of the session. Sir, yeah, uh, am, I, am I audible? To... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're clearly audible. Okay. So let us start. Uh, our, our first uh, slide is uh, uh, on uh, Lord Shiva, and according to our mythology, Lord Shiva controlled the uh, changes, and it came down in in form of six or seven rivulets and created havoc, and then it was to Lord Shiva that he had the all on this gender and for the betterment of mankind. I'm just showing this because uh, uh, that is the mandate. This is in line with the mandate of uh, Ganga Flood Report Commission that is controlling floods and uh, managing floods. Uh, and top there is a mantra, and this is about uh, praising the praising the Ganga Ma Ganga and uh, Found out somewhere and I wrote it. I had written somewhere the meaning, but I forgot exact meaning. Anyway, uh, well, uh, many things have been already discussed yesterday about hazard and uh, um, and the flood risk uh, assessment and these topics. Uh, as we you know, that the potentially damaging what is hazard is a potentially damaging physical event phenomena, human activity, and which may cause. Uh, losses in terms of property, social, economic disruption, and potentially damage in the sense that there are elements exposed to hazard that would, but not necessarily be harmed. So, uh, what I will be focusing on uh, today is uh, is on the flood hazards, and even the flood hazards. Uh, I will be uh, mainly uh, again uh, converging to the floods related to river network. That means fluvial floods, and uh, shown in the green view, these fluvial floods. I will not be, uh, although generic uh, generic uh, things are valid for other kind of floods as well, uh, but because uh, we are doing mainly in the areas of uh, inland floods, and that to flood related to your network, and. Uh, um, the factors uh, for there are various factors for estimation of risks. So we know that, and their risk assessment facilitates certain decisions. And uh, uh, watershed properties like uh, size, the size of the, the size of the watershed, 
what is the topography and what is the land use types, characteristics of storms that produce rainfall and flooding. So, number of location of buildings and other assets. So, and risk assessment naturally facilitates uh, decisions uh, making process and including land use mass planning, design of infrastructure, and emergency response preparation. And now, uh, flood hazard assessment has uh, for as far as uh, it is, it is, it is, it is to, we, we try to understand the probability that a flood of particular intensity will occur over an extension of extended time period in the sense that uh, probability that a flood of particular intensity, intensity in the sense that to what extent and to what depth uh, the flood will be there. And uh, what will uh, we try to understand probability that say in a hundred time period, say hundred years, thousand years, what would be the what, what would be the probability and uh, exceedance, probability of exceedance, and the various uh, processes are involved. Uh, I mean, in estimation, we estimate design discharge in two ways. One way is statistical discharge frequency analysis. That is when uh, we have uh, uh, flood peaks available with us and uh, and rainfall runoff for modeling when we don't have the uh, 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 river flow data with us and we do rainfall based on the rainfall we do rainfall under modeling and our purpose is to get a design discharge but the particular discharge at the point where we are seeing the problem beyond that at that point, what is the discharge passing? And then uh, we also resort to hydraulic modeling and flood plane mapping and uh, spatial extent and depth. So this is basically hydrodynamic modeling involving the uh, uh, um, maybe 1D or 2D modeling. 1D modeling means we have only take cross sections of the rivers and then see what will be the um, what will be the flood extent. And in case of uh, in in these are in case of when there there's a uh, uh, like for example the flood plane is uh, very big so in that case we sort of two D modeling that means we see the flow perpendicular as well as non perpendicular flow to the direction of the flow that means the direction of flow as well as uh, along the flood planes. So, uh, what uh, is to be understood is that this is a basically the statistical discharge frequency analysis. Now these are these are the values of the uh, peak discharge. This is wrongly written design discharge. It's actually, the peak discharge values uh, which are like this over the years, and then uh, we try to fit in a uh, probability distribution to this. It could be log normal or generalized extreme value like that. These are the various probabilities distribution, which gumball distribution, or whatever, and exceedance probability on this side, and the design discharge on this side. So uh, uh, let we take peak discharges here, and then this uh, this is one way of uh, finding out the flood plane design design discharge. And the other way is of course rainfall in the modeling. In case river flow measurements are not available, no river flow measurements are there. Then uh, we have we see certain processes uh, on the catchment and uh, the water flows over the surface, and then based on certain processes, we we see the we see what is the uh, uh, flow at the point of interest. And uh, we should know that the poorly conducted hazard and risk uh, assessment can can lead to. Uh, uh, risk management. Uh, we take the. Uh, I mean, if, if it is, if, if the risk management decisions from insufficient protection to the wasting of scarce finances on, 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 on uh, needed protection. If we have, uh, if we we don't do it properly, well, it can be either um, extra resources working or it may be um, more vulnerability to the. To the, to the surroundings, to the people, or uh, more damages. So we have to be a judicious in this regard that uh, the uh, flood hazard and risk assessment should be uh, well conducted. 
uh, so that it gives valuable support to the decision makers. And in in in, in regard to rainfall and modeling, we get uh, based on uh, and, uh, du duration and precipitation. These are called depth duration uh, frequency curves along different uh, uh, experience probability that start from say two years, five years, ten years, twenty five, fifty, up to hundred and thousand. And uh, what, what, what is the relation between the duration and the precipitation depth? This is basically an input to the RNR model to get uh, stream to get the uh, uh, water discharge at the design discharge at the point of interest. And the uh, second step we take up is uh, hydrodynamic modeling and flood plane mapping. And uh, flood stage corresponds to design discharge, which we already found the design discharge, we get the flood stage and uh, 1D, 2D model, either 1D or 2D modeling. Uh, in 1D, uh, or in, we, we get flow depth and velocity perpendicular to the, uh, uh, to the person and velocity perpendicular. No, no, I think this is officially velocity along the flow. Is something wrongly written here and sorry to be velocity along the flow only 1d modeling and or 2d we have both parallel as well as non-parallel for example as, as i said earlier like for wider flood water, water expands into the plains and also for estuaries and uh, we calibrate and validate those models and uh, use it for finding out the flood extent so this is basically we have to have some mapping uh, mapping for the uh, uh, flood extent. And uh, this is actually a image on which in which land from flood prone areas and uh, land use map has been superimposed on each other. This, this blue is a flood prone area and these are land use various kind of uh, land use which is railway airport open is symmetry and so on and so forth. This is basically these will these are uh, flood prone area overlay. That means these are the, which are the flood prone area we can see from here easily. Basically, the um, step of uh, that uh, exposure and uh, where is exposure. So that is important to see to have a uh, vulnerability assessment. That uh, vulnerability assessment consists of physical and non physical, that means economic, social, and environment, and the various uh, physical structures or economic would be lost business activities and things like that. And social, of course, deaths, particle disease, and so on. And environmental could. Due to environmental, there could be positive influence that sometimes uh, data, delta regions are uh, rebuilt and we get fish spawning area, we get agricultural soil, replenished groundwater, and then sometimes uh, negative also, especially where there is a human intervention, the flood causes negative effects of uh, scouring, sediment buildup, and landslides, and so on. So, environmentally, it's both positive as well as negative uh, aspects. Now, so far as uh, vulnerability is concerned, it could be physical as we have seen in our uh, last slide, that it could be physical as well as non-physical. And for physical vulnerability, we have uh, uh, we, we have uh, the damage curve, which is uh, very important in the sense that at what water, what will be the damage? And these are actually the 95% uh, significance uh, area, 95% percentile on either side. And this is the best fitting to the best fitting curve. And this basically is uh, about uh, um, evaluation of uh, damage, how the damage will be there, water depth. And uh, now, for example, uh, for in the case of a dike or a uh, uh, embankment, uh, there, could be, there could be damage of, it could be due to uh, scour or piping or could be due to overtopping. And when it is overtopping the bank, the, the, the uh, 
uh, migrant uh, fails and uh, and then uh, and in between there will be damage other damages other than failures so uh, we, we can see that uh, with depth and uh, with depth, what is the probability of failure uh, that is uh, seen? And uh, this is a fragility curve. That means to what extent the uh, damages are there. And uh, uh, risk assessment as this, this is, these are actually basically the conceptual thing. And uh, uh, we are supposed to do that, but uh, we are not doing it. Uh, at present, but it's very important as I see you know, that uh, this is this is actually a methodical way of uh, finding out uh, um, over uh, over over um, flood risk assessment. And generally, we engineers uh, are working in another environment, and then perhaps uh, the system management managers are working in uh, another compartment and there may be the state government working in the other compartments. So from that, uh, their perception, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, I've been able to uh, see this. We are also doing it, but maybe sometimes implicitly and uh, sometimes uh, as a support to the dynasty managers, we give them the, um, I mean, uh, dissemination of flood messages. And uh, now also for the last couple of years, we have also been into the area of uh, flood modeling. Uh, we have extended our gauge to gauge correlation, which was uh, the CWC especially, it has extended its, uh, uh, its forecast from gauge to gauge correlation, which could be at the plus for, for the safe. 12 to 24 hours one day in advance at the most, depending on uh, the base station and the flood forecasting station, just the correlation between the two statistically evaluated. And uh, for the last couple of years, they have gone into the flood modeling. And that means uh, we now see even up to three, three days, three days in advance uh, advisories, and now moved on to the five days also. Of course, it, it, it takes time to uh, have it uh, done in a, in a, in a best way. It is, it, it, is under, it is going on. And then also, um, uh, which uh, the step which was earlier, uh, that is uh, what we should say, hydrodynamic modeling and floodplain mapping is also going on. We are in this, uh, uh, CWC has already uh, gone into the area of uh, uh, the inundation forecast, flood inundation forecast, especially in the Brahmaputra Basin. And uh, so, uh, risk risk is equal to flood hazard, and of course, with exposure to flood vulnerability. That means if there is no vulnerability, there is no risk, and if there is no hazard, there is no risk. So if there is hazard as well as vulnerability, there will be risk, right? And uh, this is on the, on the uh, on this, you know. Now I have actually this is a whole process uh, how it works, uh, and it's I've been shown in uh, just one slide. Uh, here, here, if we start from. Uh, uh, from the from from say this 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 point is uh, this point that means it is statistical or RR model uh, and in this we we work out from statistical and and uh, rainfall and the model we we work out what is the design discharge that we just I uh, just just not discuss earlier we get the design discharge and uh, uh, for particular exceedance probability get the design discharge and design discharge is converted to the stage by hydrodynamic modeling and uh, flood plain mapping. Here, here, this is a foyer is obtained from uh, hydrodynamic modeling and uh, flood plain mapping. And we, we come to the, this way we come to the stage. What is the stage uh, corresponding to that design discharge? What is the stage that can be found from stage discharge? And uh, 
and of course uh, with modeling and then at the end uh, we have damage curve and uh, we worked out the vulnerability the other steps which i had shown previously basically what is the vulnerability and from vulnerability what what is the risk that means what is the damage for the given given exceed, uh, given exceedance probability what will be the damage for this damage what is the exceedance probability so that is a risk assessment and uh, this, this is actually, uh, uh, as I understand, this is exceedance probability. And uh, the exceedance probability is useful in decision making in a number of ways. Most important is the uh, average uh, annual loss or expected annual loss from, uh, from this curve. This is a uh, uh, exceedance, exceedance probability curve or risk curve. And, uh, also, we get risk reduction um, from from this. That uh, what will be the uh, estimate of how can how can the risk be reduced? Decision to reduce risk against very rare and intense floods. Yes, helps. And uh, we also work out average loss per year over long period of time, average annual loss or expected annual loss. This is an uh, this is an important problem. And uh, and also for we can also use this curve for average inventory loss uh, due to floods or an average annual number of people displaced due to floods. So uh, many things could be worked out uh, from this. So uh, now actually this is what uh, we should be doing now. Now now comes what we are are doing. But uh, yes, uh, we that's part of the flood. This assessment and, uh, of course, uh, part of the there is uh, uh, management, mitigation, or prevention of disasters. And the role of Central Water Commission is basically in flood management. And uh, we have the structural measures, non structural measures. Structural measures means keeping, uh, preventing flood waters from reaching the potential damage areas. That is keeping flood away from the people. And this is non-structural means keep trying to keep people away from the floods. So this is uh, the, the difference and uh, an integration, integrated approach needs to be, needs to be uh, adopted. And uh, this is the most effective measure of uh, structure, non-structural measure is the flood forecasting. Uh, uh, and uh, these are main, main actions by CWC I have just brought out here. Real time data acquisition is there going on since 1999, and uh, manual, automatic, and statistical correlation since 1958 when uh, flood forecasting station was established in Delhi. And uh, medium range, uh, uh, medium range three day RASI forecasts and so on. Inundation, inundation forecast, and then we have a web portal and uh, so on and we are now even going on for trying to extend the outreach through twitter facebook this kind of uh, media and this is a cycle of disaster management for flood, flood forecasting and uh, this is uh, a, a we, we have we convey our messages to the disaster manager or project authorities and uh, on their based on which they respond and uh, they activate SDME and DME and DRF and SDRF and so on. And uh, based on the feedback, we review. We review our um, process. This, of course, is rainfall runoff modeling or statistical modeling, data collection from CWC, IMD, and project authorities. This is all the flood forecasting setup. This is a divisional at the divisional office, divisional flood forecasting uh, 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 Forecasting, forecasting formulation takes place at our divisional uh, offices. Get the data from CWC, project authorities, IMD, and uh, give to civil authorities, media, and so on. And uh, then through a portal, it comes to the central flood control room where we give to the ministries and the department and NDMA and so on. And the very institutions involved with various purposes, as you can see here. And uh, uh, of course, uh, what is needed is a collaboration mode working here. And instead of um, what I feel is that more collaboration kind of uh, working is required because uh, rather than in uh, compartments, but they have their own roles to play. 
and then so data collection and forecast formulation. Data collection is also done by manually and transmission by various ways and forecast formulation, statistical correlation. Of course, with telemetry, earlier it was uh, manual, now it is turned on to telemetry system. And uh, uh, and then I, I would like to point out a, a challenge here that which we are not doing which can uh, help in, uh, uh, in betterment of uh, flood uh, flood mitigation. This is our integration operation reservoirs. That means uh, we use the different uh, reservoir, we operate the different reservoir in an integrated manner and uh, try to reduce flood in the flood affected area, which is fed by uh, these uh, reservoirs. It's a challenge in the sense that, for example, these yellow ones, uh, are the uh, these are system one of two two dams in the Ganga basin. These are another four dams, another two dams, another three dams. This is system four, and they are Im impacting in this area flood, flood risk area. So the basic challenge in this is that uh, we we at the center we need data from the state governments. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult uh, to get dam related data from this uh, dam related data from the state government. This is a major challenge in this, and that's why it's not been it's, been, it's not been implemented. But we had planned this, and in one of the basin, perhaps Ganga basin itself, huh? Ganga basin, we are we have started it. And of course, there's another challenge in the floodplain zoning. Now, now for example. Uh, Different states, uh, we had given uh, Flood Plain Zoning Act in 1975, but uh, it is still not implemented. There are still some three, four states who have enacted their own legislation, but yet to come in practice. And uh, the alibi given is that, for example, in Bihar, I heard in a meeting that they said, well, this is not possible in in uh, in uh, Bihar because there's so much population here and they're already in in, in the area. Well, uh, we think that first it should be mapped. That uh, where, where, and uh, where, where, where is where is enforcement, and why is it so? If it can't be a one-year plan, it can be thirty-year plan, twenty-year plan. At least we should stop the enforcement and give uh, according to the region. We allow the uh, various structures, like for example, hospital need to be in one in a hundred-year flood, and uh, government office could be located. And here, and in second zone, and park should be could be located in the third zone, like that. Uh, this also is a, a a challenge that should be done. It's already too late. And now I would li like to show case study based on uh, the uh, our experience in the in, uh, in the flood in the uh, central water mission. This is this is a, a case study one in which. Uh, I would like to show how the flash flood, which is a, which also is a challenge because uh, you need to predict the flash flood and then it happens so suddenly that uh, it's not difficult. It's difficult to predict. So we should uh, use IMB and uh, meteorological information to to, to predict. Um, that's one possibility. And uh, these are actually various features of that uh, project. And then. This is actually just to see. This is the Swan River, Swan Green, and there are 55 tributaries. And what happens is that there is certain rainfall in all these areas, and it just uh, in a flash it comes and it creates havoc in this area, havoc in this area, and that a very short time. Uh, I, that in a very short time. And uh, I, I, Try to show it in a video. You can see that what happened, what was before the project, and what happened after the project. That's a small video for three minutes only. Uh, th this is this is a unprotected area. You can see during floods, area how how it expands, and that's pushed for a certain short time, and it will erode the uh, agriculture areas and. Uh, Populations. Uh, you can see the vastness in this one place. Uh, that is what was before taking up the flood under flood management program.
I improved the video so as to break the monotony of the presentation. I hope it will uh, uh, give some idea on the flash flood and how quick it occurs. But is the solution given a right solution that also is uh, to be uh, brainstormed? This is a channelization actually uh, being done in a length of about uh, 80 kilometers. This kind of uh, this, is, this, is, this is what has happened after the project. You can see that this is channelization all along, including the tributary there. This is a tributary. Uh, the scenario after, after taking up the channelization. And the village is in the industries at the moment. This was funded by the central government. The tributary. Now, now you can see the difference that the area has been safeguarded. Crops and they have been grown, and uh, you know, this is rooted in their prosperity. Now, I, I, I would uh, raise a question here because you know, uh, this uh, uh, urban embankment was considered and um, recommended as a uh, short term measure, but here it is working uh, as, as a major. Uh, and this is this is this is what happens in, in Patna. You can see that in nine days, this is Patna, and you can see the water, the low lying areas, water was filled up here. This is this is this is, uh, this is what happened after the flood. So basically, we want to show here that the flood in, uh, in, in Patna in, uh, in the city is due to three reasons, basically. Uh, flood water rising here, so unable to uh, this flood, this water of uh, Patna is unable to uh, drain into the river properly. And then, uh, of course, drainage congestion within the city and the rainfall over the city as well. This brought uh, havoc in Patna. And then there's a a case study of Kerala also. We 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 made, we studied Kerala floods, uh, and uh, this is how you know it uh, the flood uh, uh, developed. Or, or these are the various uh, dams. These are Malar, IDP, and Mulla uh, Pariya, and they are uh, supposed to be fifty small and large dams over Kerala, but uh, Still, there was a uh, flood, and, and 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 then yeah, yeah. One of, <laughs> yes, one of the thing is that. In, even in the case of embankments, embankments which I showed earlier, and uh, this gives a kind of false sense of security to the people around, and then they start uh, shifting to that place. Uh, and then what happens is that, and when there's a failure, then uh, the whole things are flooded. Now, that happens, uh, for example, in Swan or other rivers, we are encroaching on the flood plain, no doubt, but. Uh, what will happen if uh, there is a failure of the magma? Well, 
that's uh, this gives a kind of false sense of security and they come over settle there start their agricultural activities start the trees and uh, here you can see how we perform two year turn period and then what happens at five year turn period in kerala and uh, 10 year return period flood and you can see that this is uh, very strong risk very strong uh, high to low and this is this high risk area it's Peria Lake actually, and then uh, and then down increasing with uh, time and 50 year even 400 year flood. Uh, uh, this analysis of major vulnerable areas, two areas are particularly vulnerable. And uh, what I believe is that we are CWC, we are doing this analysis, everything, but uh, this needs to be systemized. Uh, what I feel is there is systematic risk evaluation. Based on the processes uh, and methodologies uh, which are there for disaster management and flood risk management, uh, we might be doing implicitly, yes, but uh, they have to be systematic. So these are the key vulnerabilities and the natural hazard and uh, disaster which was uh, which took place. Uh, I will rush my uh, presentation. The role of Ganga Flood Control Commission. Well, uh, Ganga Flood Control Commission has uh, mandated to prepare comprehensive plans over the Ganga Basin, and they should prioritize and uh, and uh, in a way that integrated fashion we should plan our project. Not that we do in a peaceful manner, but in an integrated approach. These have been our achievements. Well, first comprehensive management plan, appraisal, and international cooperation, and this and that adequate waterways but what i want to show is that first uh, comprehensive management plan of 23 basin prepared by year 16 16 years and first updation was then in 18 years and second updation for the last six years uh, last 21 years six sub basins are being updated you see this is so such a process that in 18 years and 21 years things change a lot so um, um, so is the, when it was done in earlier days, yes, it was a good exercise, but keeping now the technology has changed. Uh, I mean, at that time it was done on meetings and uh, seeing the literature and uh, visiting, but now uh, we have the drone surveys, satellite uh, imageries and so on, and uh, even artificial intelligence has come into play in, uh, in, in all the fields, including this flood. So, this is a major uh, sub basin. So uh, we divided into 23 sub basins. You can see the importance of the Ganga. There is about 54 percent of population, 50 major cities, and then 24 dams and barrages. Because we are dealing with Ganga only here in GFCC. That's why I brought the uh, about Ganga. And uh, as per RBA, this is a different uh, breakup of the flood prone area. Total is 20.4 million hectare. For Ganga Basin, uh, and uh, and this is this is a by the working group. It's 24.2 million hectare. Now I listed. I tried to list on the challenge uh, yesterday, and then you can see that we need to. The different states are at different level of uh, problems uh, and different level of technology adoption. They 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 need to uh, do equitable adoption of technologies. That is why central uh, organization like, for example, MLDM and GFCC can play a big role. And uh, there's piecemeal approach. That means they have just uh, repair a magnet at one place, and next year again it is, uh, uh, I mean, failure, and again they repair it. So this approach leads to some optimal solution. You know, that, and instead of doing a holistic morphological studies or uh, uh, the for drone surveys or satellite imageries that by should be done by central agencies and uh, this is a very biggest uh, challenge that the, the co co collaboration uh, mode should be there for flood risk assessment because unless the states come on the on the front and they are taken on board then the, uh, only then the our efforts will be fruitful and identification data gaps are there. Sub basin wise flood management plans are needed because that is the unit of the flood management. And we need to prioritize the challenges. 
well, they have to be different challenges in different uh, states. In fact, different basins also the different challenges. And we should prepare some actionable recommendations, not generalized like we have been doing till now. And um, the goal will help in decision making. And of course, we have to extend our outreach uh, of dissemination to the masses. Flood, flash flood forecast, integration operation reservoir, flood plain zoning. Well, that's also a and uh, one of the and there's a paradigm shift required from conventional approach to state of the art technologies. Generalized recommendations are there. We need uh, more scientific and quantified action based recommendations are required. We need to give tailor-made solutions. I, let me tell you that comprehensive plans means uh, or master plan means that what is the plan for the whole? Uh, where does a, a an intervention fit well and at what priority that is to be taken up in the whole basin? That should be known by making comprehensive plan considering a database and uh, uh, IT based data intensive way. You see, now the time has come for um, uh, IT and data intensive programs. So, so, so you can see that uh, how far we need to go and it's already too late. Document reviews and meeting no environmental related recommendation. We need conservation of river environment also. That's a major nowadays uh, major issue. And uh, they have limited total. Well, what happens is that project people prepare a DPR, then they send it to us, then we write to them comments and uh, reply, comments and reply, the cycle follows. When the aim of the both of them is the same, that is, have a good project, then why we can't work in collaboration? That is a bit difficult preposition to be understood. The <laughs> whole process will be shortened. And uh, there's no prioritization. We need to prioritize, yes. And uh, catchment area treatment plan, action based management plans are needed. Uh, a voluminous report, and, uh, and uh, we, instead of voluminous report, we need to go in for MIS, considering various uh, 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 aspects. And then uh, what, what happens is that different processes and different activities have different periodicity of cycle. So that uh, um, and in, in fact, we need to go in for some dashboards, which should be accessible to all stakeholders. And uh, some of the some of the systems that we propose are this. You can see in red, based on uh, different uh, imagery superimposition, red is a vulnerable. You know, this is a morphological model. Uh, so in in this, uh, we, we we look out for which is a vulnerable areas, and. Uh, Prioritized and then uh, based on multi -tem multi temporal satellite imagery analysis. So, this is one of the system, the bank plan. And then, this is another that we, we should have you now. Uh, this this uh, uh, maybe from each village, one person have a smartphone, then he can upload also what is he seeing, geotagging, and upload videos or photos. And he can download also information, inundation map, flood alerts, and so on. And then, and then there, of course, fragment beat prediction. These these systems are already working somewhere. This is not a, I mean an ideal concept. These are in place. Uh, for example, this embankment beach is also taken up in Brahmaputra. And then we want to we could have we could relate the urban flooding with uh, with our uh, overall basin. I mean, the urban flooding is uh, a, a minute uh, minute. Uh, Detailed flooding for drainage system, but uh, of course that is separate done by the local administration or taken care of by that. But uh, we, we need to focus more on this, especially our last few years when there have been floods in Chennai, floods in Bombay, and uh, and also uh, there have been floods in Srinagar also a long time back. So, they need to be looked at separately in a separate way. I mean, their problems are different from holistic uh, big catchment floods, general congestion, like things like that, and and then of course uh, 
adequacy of waterways is another uh, subject because most of the bridges have very very uh, very, very less span on which uh, they are uh, due to the water heads on the upstream of the bridges that is one of the major causes of flooding in bihar too and up and uh, these areas so uh, this uh, adequacy is yeah, is our mandate is one of the mandate is adequacy checking of adequacy we were doing it manually now we will try to do it um, um started doing it on the on the uh, using the modeling and this is the and this is another thing that when dredging is uh, of the river is close to embankments in case of dredging for uh, uh, navi na navigation channels then this affects the uh, our embankment system this was pinpointed by the state government and uh, state government need can't take it with uh, with our uh, central ministries but uh, they need to have some uh, central organization who should look after this and the and wetland restoration has many benefits. Uh, this uh, is uh, because many of the wetlands and uh, have won, uh, have been encroached on. They were there earlier. This, this could be restored. That should be assessed, which can be restored and how. And then, of course, silt is one of the major component of the Ganga. Yeah, and because it brings sediment from upstream. And this new study is numerical based modeling and uh, cooperation in our area. You know, and, and then, of course, catchment treatment plan. Then uh, we have this uh, input data and the sources. And of course, uh, uh, what we, we, we process it and then analyze. Uh, we got USLE modeling, morphometric modeling. We actually discussed with this with an organization called National Soil uh, and, and Land Use Planning Organization, separate organization in this world. So um, this is after discussion with them. Uh, the catchment, why not check? Why not check the sediment, environment of the catchment, catchment area treatment plan, management of biodiversity, and even treatment of individual sub watershed post analysis can be done now the ultimate aim is to set up a river um, management information system that means all these uh, systems are to be uh, done at uh, one place and uh, um, and we can accessible to all and what ultimate uh, we get output is a data center giving all this see and uh, there, there we need some mobile interventions also. This we, we have proposed retention basin, wetland, catchment area, selective flooding, well, active public participation, then some successfully integrated approach so that the uh, the investments are judicious. They are done at the right place at the right time and in the right way. And then we issue the advisories, flood, plain, inundation, embankment, bank line advisories, and of course, a decision support system. We dynamize the policy making process and actionable interventions instead of giving voluminous uh, comprehensive plans, which uh, become obsolete in 20 years. In fact, in, in, we can have a if we have a dynamic process. Well, it's a uh, uh, it, it's a good uh, to have a DSS and uh, processes should be dynamically updated. Thanks a lot, and that's my presentation. I think I took 10 minutes more, but. Um, that's all about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your wonderful session on flood risk assessment and what are the more different modeling techniques and their features and uh, the factors uh, which influence vulnerability assessment and explaining the evolution of uh, Central Water Commission activities for flood management and what are the different roles for uh, GFCC and then so for explaining the case studies of Swan River, Himachal and uh, case study of Patna and case study of Kerala, what are the reasons for flooding and and uh, almost like I will definitely agree with the uh, well, like a proven fact that the role between uh, the coordination between central agencies for developing this kind of specific formulations regarding the flood management is also needed uh, and we think we have to work on that particularly focusing on coordination between different agencies for better output related to flood.
thank you sir thank you once again for accepting our invitation and giving a detailed presentation and sharing your experience and expertise with our participants to enlighten uh, by enlightening our participants thank you sir thank you so much thank you so much thanks a lot sir uh, as of now there is only uh, one question from uh, sri ashok kumar rath he is asking like what is on d and 2d you know, modeling what is one d and two d modeling oh okay okay one dimension two dimension modeling uh, let me tell you that one d modeling and uh, one d modeling we are both are uh, hydrodynamic modelings in one d modeling we need the we need we have availability of enough cross sections and uh, we we measure we actually um, simulate uh, that along the along the flow along the flow what will be the velocity and uh, what will be the uh, what will be the oh yes yes basically we are working in river domain only river domain and uh, and this uh, 2d modeling is uh, for when the water spreads like in uh, rivers in bihar and uh, up water spreads a lot over the flood plain and reaches the flood plain and then we need to we need to know also uh, the lateral uh, flows to what extent it will go and then 2d comes into picture so uh, nowadays of course there these things are highly developed and uh, various models are available uh, uh, for 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 this and uh, hack uh, hms is for this is of course for rainfall uh, runoff modeling hack hms hack uh, hms hack class is for uh, hydraulic made hydraulic modeling and uh, they are computer based simulation software and uh, D models, you know, calculate about parallel and non parallel flow. And they are useful in areas of complex topography, wider floodplains, road estuaries, but they require high quality data and can require computation times. So if we go over 2D, it, it will require more data and uh, it will have more computation time. And uh, that is it. And they, they, they need DTM, digital terrain model. That means you need some DEM and some DEMs are, uh, and they need also bathymetry will be required sometimes. And uh, uh, we have a um, uh, uh, digital elevation model is maybe required to know the contours. Like for a smaller area, we survey and find out what are the contours, but for a larger area, uh, um, there are aircraft based instruments like LIDAR, light detection and flood modeling activities. For shorter river section, surveys are commonly used. Um, so, so that means we, we know the topography and based on topography because we don't have uh, 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 the river flow data is not there. And precipitation is there based on the precipitation. Um, that means based on the rainfall. And based on the characteristic of the based on the idealization of the catchment, we we work out uh, what will be the uh, river flow at what point of interest without where, where there is the ungauge catchment or the ungauge catchment. Thank you, sir. Thank you for answering the query uh, from our participants. And once again, I would like to thank you, like on behalf of your busy schedule accepting our invitation and then uh, kind of like giving a detailed presentation on flood risk assessment. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now moving to the next session. Uh, so moving to the next session, we have joined with Dr. Hajit Kaur, who is presently engaged as a junior consultant in Center for Coastal Disaster Risk Reduction Resilience. She was going to take a session on uh, her, case, her research on Gujarat floods 2017, a case study. So I would like to request uh, Professor Dr. Harjit Kaur to take the session. Uh, thank you, Hari. And a very good afternoon to all the participant and uh, panelists. So today's my presentation topic is on uh, 
uh, flood case study. So basically, I will uh, focus on the Gujarat flood 2017. So before uh, moving to a technical part, I would like to share the cab, uh, COVID appropriate behavior for the awareness. So there is a, some basic rule to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. So we should uh, wear mask properly and uh, regularly wash hand with uh, soap. If water is not available, then uh, try to use alcohol-based uh, sanitizer. And please maintain the physical distancing of two feet. And uh, if uh, possible, then please get vaccinated. So now moving ahead. As uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. Shyam Dev uh, from UNICEF discussed the vulnerability of uh, Gujarat state. So, uh, here uh, I'm showing a image of flood inundation area of Gujarat for 2017. So, here you can see that uh, this uh, flood, uh, this uh, blue color in the index, you can see this indicates the flooded area in Gujarat state. So, next. Uh, even we know that if, uh, Gujarat state is vulnerable due to a various hazard, it may be a drought. Uh, uh, then now we uh, the Arabian Sea faced a South case cyclone. So basically, I'm focusing on flood. So in 1979, in 2005, and in 15 and 17, the Gujarat state faced the flood. So basically, it's uh, we usually call it as inventory. So, अगर uh, हमें किसी भी जगह की vulnerability के बारे में जानना है, so we need to focus the previous data. He is that state or area is vulnerable due to a hazard. Yes. So uh, this is the map, uh, or you can see the table where I have uh, showing the hazard and vulnerability profile of Gujarat. So basically for the flood, you can see the month of uh, uh, July to August is high occurrences from September to October, from August to October for the flood hazards. So this is the seasonality of hazards. Now, uh, for 2017, uh, the worst affected uh, district uh, was Banaskatha, Patan, Morbi, Sabarkantha, Surendranagar, uh, Mahsana, uh, and Aravli, and Ahmedabad also. So, we have prepared this map through uh, ArcGIS environment. So, the reason for uh, flooding for uh, 2017, so uh, the reason for the flooding in each area differs and as a result, so does the impact on the affected people and districts have suffered significant loss of life, property and agricultural land. So the reason for flooding is determined to be a very heavy rainfall in North Gujarat and parts of Rajasthan and the uh, then there is a release of water from uh, Datiwada Dam on 24th July. And there is incoming flow from Rajasthan state and basically the breach in the Jatpura Dam and overspilling of Javai Dam in Jalor in Rajasthan. So it inundated the several villages. And uh, in the meanwhile, the Jatpura Dam of Rajasthan uh, has been completely washed away on the midnight of July 24. And uh, it just uh, inundated the Dhanra and uh, causing a massive destruction in uh, along uh, alongside the area in Banaskata district. So uh, due to uh, from uh, our desktop study, we have decided to go for field visit and a field trip to Gujarat was planned from 3rd January 
2021 uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, time to understand the impacts of flooding in Gujarat uh, and the present scenario for flood management. So uh, the field trip include uh, travel uh, traveling to the affected districts uh, in the state, uh, uh, which are that I have already shown in the images that uh, these are the Banaskatha, Patan, Gandhinagar, Morbi, and Surendra Nagar, basically. And uh, from the NIDM team, uh, leaded by Professor Suri Prakash, head GMRD, and uh, myself and uh, Mr. Pranav Dhawan, who is a former consultant in FMC NIDM. So we visit the affected area. Uh, next. Uh, so from uh, these are the data collected uh, from the line department and we get uh, and we calculate the damage assessment uh, during the flood scenario for 2017 yes so you can see this impact of flood it's also impact on the transportation system the ahmedabad trans uh, airport also flooded during 2017 flood and transportation system uh, damage due to the flood now the next these are the images how the flood impact on the livestock and uh, these are the some uh, pictures for rescue and relief work during 2017, and these pictures are collected from the NDRF office. Now, the basic focus is a lesson learned from 2017 flood. So, first, we need to learn where to manage water. From our uh, field visit, what we have found that a large uh, means we know that a large part of India is prone to a hydrological disaster. Um, and hence, uh, uh, at various level, we need to learn to manage the scarcity as well as the excess of water. So, uh, with the growing urbanization and the effect of climate change are forcing us to do this with greater urgency and it needs to take a careful look at proper dra drainage channel, clearance of garbage from drains, integrated dam management and proper contour and precipitations inundations map we need and we need a formulate effective land management laws which ensure their enforcement and use of better technology ensuring political that will at different levels and institute uh, sorry uh, for resolving uh, the enforce rules and regulation is need for the r uh, from uh, this image you can see uh, we uh, recommend for desilting of the basin. Here uh, in the figure, you see this is the rail river bed, uh, where in the most of the areas of Dhanra, which indicates the excessive deposition of the sand. In this image, you can easily find out. So uh, similarly, the sand deposition has risen to very crucial level in the bridge. This is the railway track you can see and where the river bed is nearly four to five feet below the railway track. So during our field investigation, it was observed that the river bed has raised about 10 feet in just 10 years, which is a major concern in flood management in the Hanra area. So in uh, 2017, there was a heavy rain in the rail river catchment with an average rainfall of 257 mm so moreover the rail river has a very steep topography at upstream catchment ranging uh, from 609 to 7 uh, sorry uh, for 77 in the plain area near dhanra region so such variation in elevation along with heavy rainfall can lead to a flush flood in the catchment which has already taken place on 2017 then next uh, we recommend for drainage improvement. So, surface water drainage congestion due to inadequacy of natural or artificial drainage channels to carry the storm water discharge within a reasonable period cause damage. So, it is often difficult to distinguish between flood and drainage congestion situation. 
so this problem is rather acute in uh, sorry uh, rather acute in north gujarat part and therefore the improvement of drainage by the construction of a new channels or the improvement in the discharge capacity of the existing drainage system is recommended as an integral part of the flood management program in the country or in this uh, image you can uh, see these are the means uh, in the january month the uh, so canals is already at their full capacity. So next is uh, we will recommend a better forecast and effective synergy. So uh, we know that the weather forecasting needs to be become more effective and to achieve this, not only the science of forecasting, but also its dissemination and follow on action after the forecast needs to be improved agencies such as imd central water commission now under the ministry of jal sakti and indian national center for ocean information services in Poi should have a pre notified national and state level agencies license protocols for appropriate information and warning then we recommend a strengthening of critical infrastructure so, in order to increase the flood resilience in country, it is also crucial to make the critical infrastructure function resilient. So, there is need for appropriate disaster management plan to ensure these infrastructure are well protected from the disaster. And it is said to see some critical infrastructure facility like airport that I have already shown in the uh, in my previous slide that the Ahmedabad airport is already inundated by the flood, and uh, uh, which were the critical to mountaining a response were shut uh, as they were impacted, and uh, we need a building conservation. So uh, here uh, in the figure A, this is the. Money Temple in the Morbi districts, uh, uh, Morbi district, uh, which is a historic building, and that have been affected by the heavy rain and flooding that occurred during uh, 1979, in 2015, and in 2017. So uh, this uh, figure shows the marked. Uh, here you can see the marked HFL, uh, that is high flood level in Money Temple. You can see the height. So the HFL marking show the extent and depth of the flooding that occurred in 1979, and this marking should be used to prepare flood inundation map at regional level. Uh, yeah. Now we recommend for strengthening local capacity. So there is need to develop community-based approaches so that the community moved quickly and participated in rescue operation uh, shoulder to shoulder with the national rescue agencies and this uh, very well demonstrated the importance of the local capacity to deal with disaster and there should be a clearly articulated efforts to strengthen community capacity to cope with disaster and we need a suitable system and operational procedure that should also be in place to extend the government support to local community efforts during the disaster. Next, we recommend promote uh, support to NGOs. So it is once again uh, uh, demonstrated that the NGOs can move in quickly and support uh, in relief efforts uh, in a meaningful manner. So due to their flexibility, NGOs are able to address the specific need of the survivors. So NGOs need resources to undertake their efforts and the government should help NGOs and promote their efforts to enable them to raise resources and uh, uh, one way the government can support NGOs is by creating a label uh, playing field by uh, provisioning tax exemption to the donors uh, on par uh, with the tax exemption available for the prime minister relief fund and chief minister relief fund so then uh, we uh, recommend a timely evacuation of people to a safer location along with their uh, cattle so, uh, these uh, timely intervention also reduce the number of cattle deaths 
and in the district with the cattle population almost equivalent to the human population and the death toll is much lesser than the previous flood of 2015 and even i have uh, shown you the uh, impact of flood uh, that is the damage assessment graph uh, for the uh, population and for the livestock so a major factor uh, behind this was the timely evacuation and advance uh, warning also ensured that uh, people moved out with their cattle and the severity of 2017 flood is far uh, greater in comparison to 2015 flood. So agricultural losses and damage to crops are the right indicators for judging the severity of a flood. Even uh, better uh, that uh, the measurement of rainfall as they cannot be moved and are uh, open for the devastation. So uh, the way forward for my from my presentation is we recommend uh, suitable institutional arrangements that should be made between Gujarat and Rajasthan state. Uh, regular monitoring of flood preparedness in the vulnerable areas and uh, collection and compilation of post disaster data as uh, my previous speaker uh, mr dilo also uh, uh, mentioned in the challenges that we are lacking the data so here we also recommend uh, post compilation of the post disaster data and uh, uh, after disaster data then uh, we need to document a uh, lesson learned uh, from a disaster as uh, our Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji in Prime Minister 10 part agenda also mentioned that we need to document uh, and prepare the report of every disaster and we need to learn from every disaster. And then uh, um, we uh, recommend uh, for the effective land use policies for uh, Gujarat state and um, uh, Gujarat state need to develop a smart app for uh, various uh, disaster like uh, Chennai and other states they are doing. And uh, we also take forward the APTA Mitra uh, scheme, uh, which uh, were developed by the NDMA. That is the APTA Mitra is uh, for the community level of volunteerism. And we need to promote the capacity building of the community. So this is all from my presentation. So thank you very much. Now over to you, Mr. Hari. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, elaborated presentation on Gujarat floods, a case study which you did on field. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So moving to the next session, uh, I will take the privilege to uh, take the session on now. Just a second. So, so moving to the next session, uh, I am presenting the session on uh, disaster. Uh, flood mitigation measures and what are the best practices uh, adopted in India? Like if you see, uh, what you say, best case studies and best practices for flood management like, should be used as an adaptation model for framework uh, for management solutions. Like if you see after post flood situation, there will be a garbage deposition and there are uh, like animal carcasses and everything will be on the uh, like on the society. So. Uh, in these cases, we can adapt the best practices and uh, best case studies, which has been uh, done in the by, by the experiences of previous instances. We can take this as an uh, opportunity to uh, uh, to like uh, to construct for this better uh, like flood risk management situation. So. Okay, today I want to share the presentation on like what are the flood mitigation measures and what are the different uh, best practices adopted in, in the state of Kashmir, Srinagar, in Gujarat, and Kerala also. So we can take these uh, practices uh, whenever we required in terms of uh, flood mitigation, flood uh, situation. So before uh, talking to the uh, flood mitigation measures, I would like to comment on what are the issues in flood management in India. So if you see the basic issues related to flood management, like first one is unregulated development. Because right now, as we see, uh, India is one of the developing countries. There, there is a like second in the most population. 
So there is like huge rapid urbanization also taking place. So in order to contribute the population growth, we are develop like the development is happening in a different way. So we are like uh, in order to develop and we are encouraging the natural canals. We are encouraging the drainage systems, uh, like which is resulted in uh, floods in our societies and in our uh, country. And if there is like relief centric approach. So earlier uh, we. As a government, we used to look after the relief centric approach, not on focusing on uh, before uh, event. So once happens after that, we used to focus on what kind of relief we can uh, provide to the victim. And uh, if you see unscientific dam management, uh, if you see uh, most of our dams are uh, built by like around in the 19th centuries, which are like not that much uh, technically advanced to give the warnings and to give the alerts right now, although CWC taking the measures for like developing the telemetries and all the dams for proper early warning regarding the floods and data deficiency. If you see the uh, like history, like if you in disaster management, you can uh, make a move by understanding the previous incident history. So in India, we don't have that kind of uh, data related, like particularly related to those belongs to 18th century. Like all, we don't have that much data to move uh, forward in this kind of uh, uh, disaster management and interstate water dispersal. As you, uh, as my previous speaker also said, the main reason for uh, floods in disaster uh, floods in Gujarat is like the water release from uh, rise of state to Gujarat, which led to a uh, like flood disaster in Banaskanda district of Gujarat. At the same time, climate change. Although climate change is a global uh, issue. But it was showing impact on the flood management situation in India. Like it also leading to the vulnerability, like flood vulnerability in India, and delays in delays in completion of projects and challenges to accurate power forecasting. Because our Indian mindset is like that. Once uh, we got the warning from early warning uh, centers, nodal agencies like IMD, CMD, CWC about uh, uh, any disaster, like occurrence of hazards. So people used to take it as lightly. No, there is there won't be any uh, preparedness and response to those warnings. But we have to move this. Uh, we have to change this attitude. Although uh, the like we can't predict the uh, hazards hundred percent. But whenever we uh, rec we re uh, receive these kind of alerts, we have to be prepared in case of emergencies. And if you see uh, flood risk management, uh, if you go for uh, although like we have. In, uh, India is like uh, highly prone to floods. So uh, floods also cause very loss to our properties and then uh, human losses also there, uh, livestock losses also there. So what kind of risk management strategy we can adopt to uh, cope up with floods? The first one is like risk. If you see uh, risk management is one such field where you identify risk in advance, assess the possible losses and plan for the mitigation action if an adverse event is to take place. So uh, it can be, uh, you know what, uh, the unfortunate part is that this side of the science is not used enough in our country, despite knowing risk cannot be eliminated, but only managed. So uh, in the uh, flood risk management, the first thing is we can uh, go for a risk identification. Risk identification is the first step towards the management of the risk. So uh, in the case, it is not difficult to identify the risk uh, in current time when uh, there is a technological advancement is there and there are certain nodal agencies which give early warnings and what kind of like uh, which is working on identifying the hazard uh, like vulnerable areas for different different hazards. So although we have access of rains, extreme summers and winters uh, and uh, like ecological factor also we have to consider for this kind of risk identification. And second thing is uh, risk management, risk measurement. Risk measurement is often used to assess the impact of the risk on the economic and uh, demographic front so that the risk can be prioritized while planning for mitigation action. So in this case, uh, if you plan proper risk measurement, it will lead to uh, the losses would be uh, like uh, reduce uh, the, it will reduce the losses. Like it will be in the terms of, uh, in uh, if you say monetary value in terms of my millions low. So the key focus should be on the next step, which is on risk management. So a risk management is process where advanced action plan is created uh, uh, so in the risk management, we have to look after this kind of uh, majorly uh, chart, uh, like four concepts are there. Like first is risk avoidance. Although we don't, uh, we don't have the chance to avoid the natural hazards. So in this case, risk avoidance, we can't use the risk avoidance technique. 
but you can use the technique of risk acceptance. So a risk acceptance is a blanket acceptance of the risk. This could be accepted either with mitigation or without mitigation. So action plans can be prepared for the accepted risk. So actually, uh, in if in a real field situation, if you see uh, in the risk acceptance scenario, we used to make a action plan and either manage kept aside to address the risk, manage it arises or to be ready for crisis management. At the same time, uh, risk transfer. This kind of this is like uh, this risk management uh, techniques are more of financial uh, view. So in the risk transfer situation, we can manage the risk by uh, uh, by the risk is passed to third party in lieu of premium. So insurance are you right now? We are going uh, for the different insurance field where we are focusing on disaster insurance, like disaster risk insurance. This can be techniques, it can be utilized in this risk transfer techniques and risk mitigation. So risk mitigation is uh, the best option which requires minimum cost and maximum results. This action requires an advanced thinking when everything is fine about and how to stop the flood if it rains heavily. So we should have to develop a scenario and also require to address what actions will be taken if certain uh, like unexpected events like rain and flood or like with different intensity, what kind of uh, impact it will show on the community. This kind of uh, scenario you have to develop and then you have to assess the situation and then you have to make the, um, uh, you have to take the action for proper mitigation activities. So uh, if you come to flood mitigation measures, Generally, we used to talk about two kinds of measures. One is like structural measures and second one is non-structural measures. Uh, if you go for structural measures, you can go for uh, protection works, flood embankments, like our previous speaker, uh, the Lonsa said, like channelization of canals. That can be a structural measure. And if you go for non-structural measure, it will be like more of going through adaptation, like flood forecasting, flood warning, and flood plan zoning. So if you see the picture here, Structural measures limit the damage produced by water by constructing a dam or by constructing a retaining wall like that. While non-structural measures make buildings adapt to flood effects. So these can be non-structural measures can be adapted after developing this flood plan zoning and then developing proper guidelines on which level it pay impact. So after considering these uh, specific guidelines and then studies and the vulnerability profile, you can make the non-structural measures. So uh, after that, I want to uh, share what are the best practices adopted uh, during the floods in Gujarat and uh, during the flood like uh, 2013 and then 2014 floods in Srinagar. So uh, if you see, uh, Gujarat is highly prone to floods. So uh, actually there were two spells of flood season observed in the year of 2013, where uh, most of the states, uh, most of the uh, districts like Rajkot, Baruch, Vadodara, Porbanda, Surat are highly, and Jamnagar are highly uh, affected by these floods. So, and one more aspect of the flood is the magnitude of flood in each of the districts was different. Uh, so, because it, it can't be like that, uh, you can't adapt the same technique in all the district. So, what are the best techniques there, like best practices they adopted in the Gujarat state is, the first best practice we observed is training and capacity building activities conducted at district level. So, the trained persons had participated in response activity in various districts. Moreover, the evacuation shelters identified disaster management plans are also used for evacuating flood affected people. And also the state disaster resource network also played a vital role in locating resources and contacting the concerned persons at all levels. And uh, in Rajkot, they used the system called mobile alert system called disaster alert and resource management application and technology. So this was kind of Android application, which is used uh, in Rajkot for alerting the uh, flood prone areas person. Actually, you know, through this system, the operator can select the dam and amount of water, which is expected to be recharged from this dam. Although like it has an inbuilt database where it has the data related to uh, contact information of uh, representatives like serpents, Anganwadi workers, paramedical staffs and school principals, etc have the data in their database. When there is a release of water from certain uh, dams, so they will give the alert to those representatives saying that uh, this much uh, water is released from this dam, this will uh, lead to the platoon areas in this area. So that they will get the alert warning so they can make uh, get prepared to move to evacuation or some kind of uh, actions can be taken in prior to the 
floods. At the same time, uh, in Baruch, they, uh, they installed automated weather systems and radar based water level sensor, like which is also kind of a uh, early warning system. In the com coming session, we'll, uh, Dr. Rajatap will uh, take a detailed session on the uh, early warning system. So, and if you go for uh, the best fly attacks in uh, Srinagar, so after 2014, uh, Srinagar at, uh, flood, the total roads, the total streets are covered with uh, dust, like garbage and animal carcasses and everything. So what they did is, first thing uh, they use the like while uh, while uh, facing the flood, they use the uh, techniques of like advanced technology like remote sensing and GIS tools can be uh, like. It's also proved that beneficial for flood monitoring and implement uh, implement like mitigation methods like desiltation water detention reservoirs and other methods like remote sensing uh, is also used in uh, preparedness uh, response and mitigation for floods if you see the flood prone areas can be identified at an earlier stage by using these tools like which also lead to uh, led to like a reduction in the uh, reducing the uh, impact of the flood at the same time i the uh, what is it? sorry uh, and there is one more thing we need is the capacity building of the urban local bodies is very important because uh, this includes standard operating procedures, evacuation plans, and in, and uh, interdepartmental task force with a clear chain of command and coordination channels, like preferably headed by apex level authorities at the state level. So uh, it only uh, it also helpful in providing a legal and administrative uh, framework for rebuilding the. Collapsed infrastructure and commercial properties and homes in case of any damage happen due to floods. And uh, if you see the Srinagar model for uh, monitoring, coordination, supervision, and direction, like proved to be one of the efficient model uh, to face uh, urban flood situation. And if you see developing effective communication systems are also a very crucial in uh, disaster management process and building resilient cities. Like along with communication, safety is also another crucial parameter for livability. So to enhance the city's livability, it is also important to have an orientation and focus on policies towards the vulnerable section of the cities. And the last and uh, foremost, the uh, the best technique uh, followed in uh, Srinagar region, disaster management strategies require strong partnerships from the cities. So in order to have an active and uh, flourishing partnership, strong advocacy for knowledge sharing and capacity building, citizen engagement in the planning process, and evidence-based decision making is required. It's not like that uh, some uh, technique adopted in some uh, southern countries also can be followed in the north, northern countries. It can't be like that. So it depends on the, we have to develop a certain strategies based on the specific location, because uh, location have different uh, topographic and then topo uh, geographical features. So while developing these uh, practices, we have to look after those certain uh, site specific conditions also. So like this, uh, although uh, now there are like, uh, the technology has been more advanced and then there are so many DRI innovation has been taking place during the recent times. If you see uh, right now in cities, we have the situation of urban flats like, uh, which caused, which causing like very demonstra like demonstrating uh, experiences in the cities. So if you see the uh, best, uh, I want to mention a few innovations in uh, flood control measures like the rapid response water gate, water inflated uh, property protector, and quick dam and flood blocks. If you see water gate, it's a clear PVC device that uses the pressure of oncoming uh, water to stabilize itself. So while more expensive than sandbags, it has been proven to be a highly effective means of containing flood dams. Like a single person can deploy the product in a few hours to protect home or larger devices can be purchased to protect entire areas and unrolled trucks. And the second thing is like water in, uh, inflated property protector. So uh, if you see the basic idea for uh, this uh, product is fight the water with water. Essentially, it's a long tube with an internal support structure. The system can be inflated with any nearby water source and acting as a heavy barrier against the coming reservoir, coming waters. And if you see quick dam, uh, it's a kind of, uh, if you see, if you go for our traditional practices, we used to keep our sandbags, like uh, the bags filled with sand to control the air, uh, to divert the uh, water coming, like flood water coming to the uh, sites. So instead of using the sandbags, you can use this uh, quick dams where uh, if one 
like swelled bags uh, contain uh, divert flood water it can like it can absorb water and then it will act as a uh, barrier for the uh, to divert the uh, water flood water and at the same time that uh, you have flood blocks it's a kind of lego like invention that can be interlocked and then stake and position uh, like position to product homes like these are small small innovations we can say the uh, disaster resilient materials which can used in the flood uh, the flood management situation these innovations are very small but while using on the situation it can help in reducing the losses in a very high range so with this uh, i would like to uh, conclude the session and uh, thank you thank you for listening to my uh, presentation now moving to the next session uh, we have joined with uh, dr raju tapa Sir Raju, sir, are you there? Yes, yes, Hari, I am here. Okay. Uh, before uh, before passing on the stage to Dr. Raju Tapa, I would like to uh, give a brief introduction about Dr. Raju Tapa to our participants. Dr. Raju Tapa is currently working as junior consultant in Early Warning and Communication Center in the National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. Before his engagement uh, in NADM. He has worked on major projects sponsored by Department of Science and Technology, uh, Science and Engineering Research Board. And he was also associate with the Board of uh, Research in Nuclear Sciences, Department of Atomic Energy sponsored uh, major project. He is also a recipient of several awards and fellowships at the national and international levels. And he had uh, more than 45 publications in some of the leading journals under the publisher of Elsevier, Taylor and Francis and Stringer and uh, national and international uh, conferences, etc. His key research interests include remote sensing and GIS and its application to water resources and uh, contaminate hydrology, groundwater potential, mapping, landslides assessment, etc. So uh, today, Dr. Raju Tapa is going to take a session on early warning uh, communication re in relation with the floods. So uh, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you on board, sir. Uh, can you Are present me? What do you say? Right. Just a second. Sir. Just a second. Yes, sir. I have provided the right to share. So, good afternoon. Sir, uh, sorry to disturb you. I think there is a network issue. Dr. Raju, sir. Should we stop my video? Uh, am I audible, Hari? Is it, is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now we can hear your voice. Okay, okay. So, uh, so I am turning off my video uh, since uh, there is a network issue. So, since we are already running late, uh, uh, so please excuse me accident. I will be running a little faster. Uh, please uh, cope up with that. Uh, so I will uh, the responsibility that has been given to me by the organizers uh, by uh, by our uh, Hari and other uh, other organizers is to talk about the basics of early warning and communication. And I will also just lightly touch upon uh, who are the notice agencies and what they are currently doing in providing us the early warning uh, in related to flood. But uh, before we move ahead to, to our main uh, project, main thing, uh, it is very important. I think my other speakers have also highlighted. Please follow all the respiratory, all the COVID-19, you know, uh, appropriate behavior. It is very important. Though uh, now we are reporting, with, uh, we have considerably less number of cases, but still we cannot do any negligent. We have to be prepared. We have to follow all the precautions necessary. So. Uh, Definitely, if you consider last uh, few years data, the, the number of disasters uh, occurrence are, are, are on a rise. And uh, if you see here also, uh, the, the number of disasters, uh, if you can consider 20, 20 years data, two decades data, you will see that the number of disasters has incre increased uh, tremendously. Apart from that, one more important thing, just uh, I would like to keep it to your notice that see the number of uh, uh, you know, uh, total deaths. Uh, the number of total deaths is, uh, though the number of disasters has increased double, but the number of deaths are almost same. 
and one of the main factor that is contributing to this this almost equal number is the advancement in science and technology just like my previous hari hari was speaking speaking the science and technology so early warning system early warning and communication system they are definitely playing an important role in providing us in the, all the vital information that is necessary to take the all the immediate actions um, required to save our life and uh, uh, needless to say, I think that uh, from the past two day, uh, days you have been learning. So you, by the time you know that uh, in a flood, they are the most common disaster that is occurring. Around 44% of all the disaster, if you consider, is flood. So you see why it is very important to understand the flood and why it is important to talk about flood in such a big international platform. Mm. And in these figures also, you can see like the total number of disaster. You consider any any disaster, whether it is drought, whether it is an earthquake, whether it is temp, temp uh, like extreme temperature. Everybody everywhere you see there is an increase in you know um, uh, the number of disasters rather than uh, decrease. So uh, which definitely is, um, bring bring uh, like ring a bell in our mind that we need to do something uh, urgently and very effective. Uh, the steps are need to be taken. And uh, uh, if you if you just see the see the number of disaster reported, you will see that the uh, highest number is uh, they are uh, mostly they are some reported from USA and uh, you know India, China, particularly Asia because um, uh, because Asia they, uh, they are very highly they have high frequency of uh, disaster because of this um, their geoclimatic conditions because of their you know um, they have their flood plains they have their uh, river basin they you have here. The seismic fault line, everything is here. So, because of all that, various types of disasters uh, they occur here uh, regularly. And uh, also, uh, if you see China and India, typically they dominate the. If you see the total population affected, the list of population. Whenever you talk about that, you will see that uh, they dominate China and India. They dominate the list of countries by impacts uh, about absolute. When it, we talk about the absolute numbers, largely due to the massive population, because. Uh, when I when I will say what you name the two highest population uh, populated country in the world, China and India. So you can imagine that. And also mm, uh, in, in India, one more thing that has been uh, noticed by several researchers is that because of the financial problems, sometimes uh, because of the uh, people who are uh, who are living under poverty or in the near about uh, the poverty line, they are sometimes forced to live in you know, more uh, you know disaster risky area, vulnerable areas. Because of that, also when disaster occurs, they are mostly affected and to support that also um, if you see this uh, report from UNDP United National uh, Development Program you will understand that a disaster uh, disproportionately it affect those with the lower socioeconomic status uh, including those suffering from poverty as well as minorities and discriminated uh, group in many developing countries uh, also you will see that uh, uh, women they are also uh, you know uh, affected more uh, and also, uh, one more thing that is uh, important to consider here is the um, the gender inequality in the death ratio and livelihood losses during natural hazards. Uh, natural hazards. And uh, in 2000, this is the 2013 UNDP report, uh, which shows that particularly women and children. If you see women and children, they are more vulnerable to compared to men. Particularly, if you consider this women and children, they are 14 times more vulnerable as compared to men. So, which definitely speaks a lot by itself. And um, just to give you an example, uh, take the example of uh, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, where more than 70% of the victims were women. Similarly, in the 2008 um, cyclone Nargis in Myanmar, it killed twice as many women as um, men, particularly in the age of 18 to 60. And also in 2005 uh, Hurricane Katrina, it affected predominantly, you know, the African American women. Which, which give us an idea that the poor minorities are more exposed to natural disaster. And also, the, if you see this um, figure right here, it will show that um, just in 1996 to 2015 data that 47% of the people uh, death, those who are dying from uh, uh, you know disaster, 47% uh, are from low income group, which which uh, itself speaks a lot. Uh, and as we go higher uh, in the uh, you know economic class, you will see the number of death reducing. So the, this was the point that I was trying to make. And also, uh, just just for your notice, traditionally, uh, if you see in India, the concept of disaster management, it has evolved from an, you know, uh, the re reactive response uh, approach to a proactive response. So in the, the standard approach, uh, these humanitarian organizations and our other organizations, they are reactive. 
which basically means whether it is landslide, whether it is cyclone, flood, any disaster, they will occur first. And to that, there will, there will be in response uh, to a, after occurrence of the disaster. So you can see here also. So that was our approach. So, but now mm, uh, with the advancement of uh, early warning and system and with the advancement of science and technology, uh, with the um, with our nodal agencies, various nodal agencies that have been put up um, by our government of India uh, to to monitor and to to uh, measures the up um, and also to provide the early warning for various disasters. We have early warning system. We have uh, early warnings for some of the disasters. So because of that, now we're in some we have some enhanced approach in some of the. Uh, some of the disasters. So for that, in enhanced approach, what is the sequences? We uh, for any disaster, there will be an early warning. After based on that early warning, you will take action. Suppose we take the case of uh, uh, let us take the case of flood. So flood. Once you have uh, early warning, you will take your actions and you will uh, you will go to some elevated area, whether on top of your house or. Uh, anywhere you will go to an elevated area base uh, after that the disaster event will occur at our present knowledge of science and technology we cannot stop natural disaster uh, we don't have that much science and technology yet uh, so di natural disaster will occur and after that the response team will come and if you are already in an uh, elevated area in top of a building or any elevated area then the response team can easily save your life so this approach is called enhanced approach and this is why you know what we also promote and we also want to uh, convey the message to our participant that this is an approach that uh, needs to be in standardized everywhere so uh, India basically uh, now I think already know that India is vulnerable to a large number of disasters, uh, whether it's earthquake, landslide, flood, cyclone, tsunami, uh, you know, drought, talk about any disaster, you will, everything is here because um, uh, there are several factors that are contributing to that, both natural and anthropogenic, to talk about the geoclimatic conditions, talk about the geo topographic features of India, talk about the environmental degradation that is going on, the pollution, population explosions, the uh, pollution, the urbanization, uh, also the industrializations, the non-scientific development practices that, that uh, goes on all these things it contribute and it also it uh, it, it rather it uh, it add up to the already vulnerable uh, areas of our country so basically what is early warning system so early warning studies are nothing they are the sets of measures to increase our resilience to disaster uh, and uh, just to give you an idea how effective is an early warning system there are many examples that we can discuss but uh, the most common example and the most uh, um, effective example that you can see is the 1970, 1977 cyclone in andhra pradesh in india which killed more than 10000 people while a similar storm in the same area you know it it killed only around uh, less than 1000 people around 900 people 910 people so this drastic difference was due to the fact that a new early warning system was there uh, in in that area that was connected with the radio station and that that gave alert to the people and uh, similarly the people they were alerted they they took necessary action and they moved to a higher elevated area that have saved several lives so this is an example wonderful example between where we can see the drastic change and the concept of early warning you know early warning and communications and the need of that uh, in, in in disaster management is not uh, only discussed in india but is it is uh, its it, importance is felt all over uh, the globe you talk about the paris agreement you talk about the sustainable development goal all the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction everywhere the need for early warning system has been highlighted similarly in the pm 10 point agenda the 10 point mandra type was laid down by prime minister sri modi in 2016 in asian ministerial conference on disaster risk reduction it also highlights that uh, we need to um, uh, work together uh, to uh, and also we need to enhance the, uh, our country's disaster risk resilience using the 10 mantras that was put down that was also discussed uh, yesterday by uh, our uh, sri anil sir so uh, the question might come to your mind that why do we need early warning system so basically the first and foremost point that why we need early warning system is um, the public safety is the safety of the people uh, and the protection of human life and the second is the protection of the uh, the, the national resources base and the productive assets the national uh, you know the productive assets i mean to say the infrastructure the uh, the private pro property or the investment which will ensure a long term development 
um, and economic growth. Or conversely, also we need to understand by reducing the impact of disaster, a government it reduces um, its cost, massive cost of burden. You know, it's a very burden to invest in rehabilitation. So a government uh, always saves on that. So it's very important to um, consider this point also. So uh, quickly, I will also le let me discuss the component of early warning and communication. So uh, as the definition highlights, an early warning system is not just an uh, you know as a symbol of any one part. It's it's an it's a complete combination with a network for transmitting warning to the public. So it itself consists of uh, several important um, component, or I will say parts of it. So uh, which which consists of the risk knowledge. Which, which has uh, monitoring and warning services, uh, the dissemination and communication and the you know, response capacity. All these working together makes an, uh, makes an effective early warning system. So let us just quickly discuss each point. So risk knowledge is nothing. Risk arises from combination of hazards and vulnerability at a particular location. For this reason, risk knowledge is a very key important to successful early warning system. Uh, basically, if you don't know uh, your area, if some, if you, to, establish an early warning system or to understand your uh, you know to increase your uh, preparedness toward disaster risk reduction in your area you should know what are the um, disaster that are implanting there what are the risk of a disaster that your area is facing until and unless you know your area well you know that um, risk that you are facing how will you take the appropriate actions to that so for that's why we need risk knowledge as an important parameter and it is very important to carry out and risk knowledge of your area before moving ahead uh, with the you know, other monitoring services the second point is the monitoring and warning services and uh, most of the time we whenever we talk about early warning system this is what people think that this is our early warning and early warning system but this is just in part of early warning and communication system so monitoring basically means collecting information and um, along with the sets of proxy variables related to risk Suppose you want to measure the flood, what are the perimeters you will measure? Suppose um, for that you will go for, you know, the automatic radar stations uh, where you will collect the, uh, suppose, uh, rainfall data, how much, how many centimeters or millimeters of rainfall has occurred. Similarly, if you want to study, suppose um, uh, you want to understand the uh, earthquake, so you will go for the, suppose, the land, uh, you know, the, um, the uh, seismic wave data. So this type of data that is monitoring and all this uh, is very, that all comes under monitoring and services and now like Hari, uh, like Hari sir was also speaking about the advancement of science and technology definitely um, with the advancement of satellite image it is satellite technology also it has added to, um, uh, to the you know fast and reliable assessment of an area so uh, where earlier on field visit it, it was very laborious it consumed a lot of money a lot of time a lot of human power you know a lot of resources now with the advancement of science and technology that can be done in a lab with you know with very less expense in resources as compared to earlier with the, and more important the time in disaster which is very very important uh, similarly land based radars uh, the, the doppler radars the automatic weather stations all that also that are also used apart from that own ground points also of measuring the water flow the um, suppose uh, in river if you have the various monitoring stations are placed by the cwc in the central water commission so their monitoring stations the on ground record all that point are also important and after having all this data it is uh, useless until unless you you uh, bring out some information from that data so trend analysis of the online you know from that data uh, uh, coming so that you can uh, deduce something useful from that data is very very important and definitely for that we need some skill laborers who can understand those data who can come up with an prediction uh, where our nodal agency play a very important role in that so that uh, it, a, a very well informed scientific information can be transformed and very um, you know uh, reliable warning can be uh, can be reduced from that warning once uh, we have done monitoring now we suppose uh, we are uh, now we have one warning for any disaster support cyclone so that needs to be disseminated and communicated to the people to the journal public particularly to the uh, community who are at uh, who are at danger so that information should reach the, uh, those people for that you know various um, systems are used various means support the radio the television the social media the mobile app the websites you know sirens speakers community everybody everybody have their own the own reach and own um, own uh, 
importance definitely for um, some of the disaster the print media also have a very important role to play suppose in cyclone and all but some of the disasters like the earthquake uh, which are very sudden and sometimes are very hard to give uh, prior predictions and um, print media can be limited but with the advancement of mobile technology mobile app sms you know all that technology they have definitely provided a platform where information can be disseminated at you know very quickly to a large number of people and websites and email id of the concern or organizations uh, they are always there and community radio of, of course it is very very important uh, particularly in disseminating information to the um, to the local people sometimes uh, all areas are not well connected to the centers uh, in the remote areas where um, the, where the people are supposed uh, not very comfortable with english or hindi language in those areas the uh, vernacular language, uh, the community can can play a very important role in uh, in you know transforming and translating the important information to the people in their vernacular language and in giving them uh, very precise ideas what needs to be done immediately. And uh, and one more thing that I would like to highlight is that uh, the may the that in most of the time you we have to take in consideration that um, the message that is transformed uh, and information that is passed from one level to another is very clear whether it is passed horizontally or uh, you know vertically it should be very clear so that the recipient of the message can act very promptly and it's uh, uh, before passing it if you have also the information you should um, try to understand that whether that message is clear or not because um, you have to check whether that message um, you know uh, uh, clear all these um, questions or not who is it about who that message who is it talking about what is what is it talking about what is going to happen whether that thing is clear on that or not when it going to when when is that disaster or when is that incident is going to happen where is going where it is going to take place why is it going to take place? all that silly silly simple simple um, answer should be uh, there so that the people based on that understanding they can take immediate action and uh, the last component is and uh, which is also very um, you know important to consider in all warning system uh, and to succeed in uh, succeed in you know uh, applying a response to warning it is very vital that the all our community also the endangered community have trust in early warning system and they are also well prepared so um, uh, their preparedness and prompt response uh, response can be additionally we have to enhance them uh, by giving them mock drills on and training and also by providing sometimes the checklist of actions to undertake in certain uh, certain uh, you know certain scenario and definitely uh, that will uh, that will enhance our response and also that will enhance our uh, coordination and cooperation with the uh, with the nodal agencies and the people will be more aware about how to how to take um, immediate actions during uh, disaster work and one more thing that that is uh, that is in observed that during disaster uh, in, in normal cases uh, when there is uh, no warning sometimes uh, the traffic uh, the communication traffic is uh, is very light but uh, during disaster when everybody wants to, to get in contact with the um, in disaster area with their loved and dear ones so it is seen that there sometimes that there is a network breakdown and disaster situations sometimes sometimes most of the time uh, the communication network is down so during that time so we have to always uh, keep ourselves prepared with alternative ways of communications where ham radio ma2 radio you know other community radios can play a very significant role so uh, overall, uh, we can say that effective early warning system uh, are then assemble of different components uh, to inform the community in a timely manner about the imminent threats. Mm, for example, the flood early warning system use different data inputs from the satellite imagery, you know, uh, the satellite imagery, rain radars, flow coach, they have their own, you know, setups that they use to collect the data. And these data are used by the team, the scientists who are the skilled people who use this data to come to a prediction. Uh, and that uh, prediction that forecasting is uh, is transferred to the uh, via various media that we discussed that medias and their and their websites, these websites are used to pass on that information to the threatened community. And based on that, uh, and, uh, and uh, the other actions, the immediate actions are taken by the community. So uh, in gist, we can say that effective end-to-end -end, uh, people-centered warning may include all the four components uh, that we discussed, uh, that is risk knowledge, um, uh, detection and monitoring, we should, uh, and also um, 
you know uh, the third component that is a uh, dissemination and communication so uh, so risk knowledge first component the monitoring the second component the uh, dissemination the third component and our response preparedness so all these component all together they makes and complete you know uh, people's entire early warning system so uh, i won't discuss this because this has already been discussed so different uh, ministries looks after different uh, hazards and we are there are different agencies that has been uh, in cobra that has been given the responsibility uh, to uh, to monitor and forecast give warnings for various disasters and um, just here i would like to um, uh, that uh, you know uh, these uh, central water commissions and google they have been working together uh, to provide uh, early warning uh, for um, particularly for flood so this is a map where uh, google's are currently uh, providing flood early warning uh, in india see uh, this is the area so for that is very easy, easy you just have to go to google and type flood forecasting in your mobile so it will directly give you the uh, forecasting so that is an also initiative that was carried out by uh, this google and uh, forecasting initiative with Google and the CWC, our nodal agency for um, flood central water commission. So, uh, and the uh, and the coverage uh, area of uh, their current operation flood forecasting system. Uh, this is what this picture is representing. And uh, also, if you see, in addition to the expanding in India, they are also planning uh, that in Bangladesh also with Bangladesh Water Development Board to bring out warning and services in, to Bangladesh also. Uh, and uh, their predictions are based on a hydrologic, uh, like, uh, hydraulic models where uh, they use satellite imagery, Google Dam, you know, uh, and with the help of government, uh, Central Water Commission in our case, and with the uh, with the uh, the networks that they have, our Central Water Commission, the gauge measurements and forecast that they have in place, they come to an um, Google hydrologic, uh, you know, modeling. And this modeling, if you see, uh, basically all these data, uh, they are incorporated in one platform uh, using uh, remote sensing and GIS and all these la layers, they are ke keeping one model upon another. And based on that, uh, the prediction is, uh, they are generating a prediction, um, which uh, which is, uh, that prediction is later on uh, shared with the general public, uh, so, so that uh, immediate actions uh, can be uh, taken. And uh, that data are uh, so, you know, fully based on uh, the, the data collected from on ground, whether that is, um, as you can see in the figure also, uh, this is the final prediction model that comes. And uh, these are all based on this, all the, the measuring uh, stations that are put in place based on that and prediction is made. Uh, uh, see, based on that and prediction is made, suppose this water, which, which area is vulnerable to which disaster. So, and that is later on disseminated to your mobile. So this is a very, uh, I think, very good initiative that is uh, coming up and it is very uh, user friendly also and it is available um, to everybody. And this Google public alert, uh, uh, you just have to go to Google search, it will show you map and uh, if you, whatever reason you are located, if you are lo uh, located in severe flood uh, situation, it will show if you are in away from uh, uh, flood area, you, it will show normal flood situation. So it is... Uh, very user friendly and also they provide that uh, information to the government also to our government also so that they can also take immediate action so uh, provide they also provide to local ngos also to distribute to the community mm, uh, so uh, flood categories like the sops in flood forecasting uh, uh, there are color codes that are used um, so basically it's like the journal uh, uh, color code where uh, red extreme uh, means highest uh, flood uh, level particularly above normal means when the water is uh, uh, just uh, above the normal line when the due to heavy rain and when a danger severe that is uh, orange color is flagged when uh, the water is uh, flowing above the danger line these are all marked in their observatory you know um, uh, measurements and also the highest uh, extreme flood is whenever there is the highest flood ever recorded in that measuring and you know flood recording monitoring stations if that is the highest flood recorded then that is extreme similarly uh, modernization like our cwc also taking various action <clears throat> like automatic real time data acquisitions that they also giving three day advisory forecast uh, based on rainfall modeling and also the google uh, collaboration with google just that was what i was explaining uh, apart from that, NDMA also has developed several, you know, uh, 
guidelines to for management of flood whether this is management of flood uh, for urban flooding for uh, uh, glacial outbursts blow so all this i think which will be very helpful for you to go and have a look in ndma websites so um, uh, in the end just to uh, bring out that uh, you know uh, there are a range of uh, issues that should be taken into account when designing and uh, maintaining the effectiveness in early warning system. Effective governance is definitely one of the points that we need to consider because uh, this is one of the very key points. Uh, we have to consider, you, as you have seen in the current pandemic situation also, that um, disaster can have a cascading effect. So multi-hazard, we need to have, to have a multi-hazard approach. And involvement of local community is very, very important uh, in, in any say, in successful implementation of early warning system because until unless uh, the community they themselves involve in any uh, in the, uh, like uh, uh, implementation of warning system or anything the effectiveness will be always you know uh, minimized and also considering of gender perspective like i said earlier because in any disaster we have to consider the gender wise also like uh, uh, what what about the women and men who are left there we have to think about the uh, cultural gender and other characteristics that influence their capacity to effectively prepare uh, and also prevent and respond to disaster we have to think about the elderly people we have to think about the um, uh, the you know the disabled and the socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, people so we have to consider everybody when we are planning an early warning system so uh, also to who are the key, key actors who can play a role the community no doubt they themselves because uh, nobody can understand the, their area better than the community themselves so definitely they have a very important role to play on that apart from that the local government also the panchayat the state governments the district government they also have a role to play apart from the central governments they do have a they have a very important role uh, in policy planning and financial aspect the regional institutions and organizations they provide you know specialized knowledge and advice which support nationals uh, particularly the uh, in uh, suppose uh, we always don't have to learn from our mistakes we can learn from the uh, experience of other countries also in in that type of uh, uh, bringing out case to, uh, case studies or bringing out uh, collaborations with different institutions that can be promoted by you know, know regional institution organization international bodies the un bodies they also can um, uh, play very important the ngos the private sector the science and academic community everybody have a very important role to play in that so um, uh, way forward we that is based on our current observations and also as highlighted in various you know the un uh, reports also it is it, there is a required for strengthening disaster risk there is no doubt and uh, uh, the public and uh, private investment in disaster risk prevention and reduction through whether that is through structural or non-structural measures needs to be stepped up to create disaster resilient societies and we also need to focus on sharing of knowledge and information in local language also which i was uh, talking about to reach to the community residing in remote areas with limited understanding of hindi or english language and uh, technology innovation broadcasting technologies and system for use in emergency communication needs to be continued continuously improved and improvised and we need to continuously modify that and better data collection is also one of the key point because until unless we have the good um, data source uh, which gives us an uh, accurate uh, you know the um, accurate uh, information about the current situation out there on the ground how can we take an effective uh, steps for that uh, good data source is also important so with that uh, i end my presentation I hope I, I was able to contribute something to the training program. Back to you, Hari, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your detailed presentation on early warning communication system and then how it works and then what are the major components in early warning communication system. And the major fact you mentioned is like on which kind of data you have to rely uh, during the emergency situation. Because uh, nowadays, uh, like uh, social media, like there are so many false information is passing through the passing to the uh, citizens, which is like they are in such kind of situation, which like, which kind of uh, information has, they have to believe. So uh, this guy, so uh, I advise all the participants to rely on the data, which is really, uh, released from the authentic uh, nodal agencies. Like if you go for IMD or CWC, you have to uh, rely on those kind of data only, not from the social media, not from the other sources which are not relevant and not uh, readily like not uh, up to the like as per authenticated data. 
Thank yes, you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I fully agree with you, Harry, that yes, uh, we have to uh, rely on, uh, particularly after the uh, after the in uh, this COVID nineteen the infodemic that we have faced, where we were, you know, we had a tsunami of information, um, some true, some not true, right? So during that time also, it has been, uh, it has been, uh, you know, understood by all the governments, not only India, abroad also, that right information is very important and uh, right information at the right time to the right people to the right medium. I think that is very important rather than trusting the um, false fake news we should always rely on uh, reliable data that will not only uh, you know um, save you from the uh, disaster happening that will also that can also save lives of situations thank you sir thank you for your valuable comment and valuable session on early warning communication i hope uh, my participants received the enough knowledge related to early warning communication which can use in the in terms of emergency communication Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude the today's uh, training program. And uh, before concluding the today's uh, training program, I would like to thank, uh, I would like to convey my special thanks to Major General M.K. Bindal, Executive Director, National Institute of Disaster Management, and Professor Surya Prakash, Head GMRD, for giving me this opportunity to conduct this training program. And I would also like to convey my special thanks to um, major, uh, uh, sorry, Sri P K Jena sir, IAS, uh, who is the MD of OSDMA, and Dr. Kamalo Chandmishra, Executive Director of OSDMA, for their collaboration with NIDM for this training program. And I would like to also uh, convey my special thanks to our colleagues from GMR Division, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Hajit Kaur, Dr. Raju Tapa, uh, Sri Anil Katai, uh, Ms. Deepali Jindal, Sri Ajit Batam, for their continuous support. Uh, for this training program and i would also like to thank our uh, technical team from nidm for their uh, coordination and contribution to uh, for this training program and i would like to convey my special regards and special thanks to today's uh, distinguished speakers uh sri ms dillon sir who is the gf uh, chairman of gfcc and uh, dr hajit kao jc nidm and uh, dr raju tapa JC and IDM for their value, valuable uh, session uh, towards uh, like for the empowering uh, for an enhancement of knowledge to our participants related to flood risk management. And finally, I would like to not finally, but last but not least, I would like to convey my special thanks, special heartfelt thanks to all the participants for their active participation by raising their questions and their very active listening to the sessions. Uh, and uh, I would also I would uh, uh, like to request all the participants to be active for the uh, upcoming third year training program where we are focusing on recovery uh, response and recovery aspects of flood risk management where we have where we have the subject experts from OSDMA and uh, NDRF where uh, we hope we can empower the knowledge of flood risk management related to response and recovery option for like in case of emergency situation where we can use these techniques. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude the today's session. And before concluding the session, uh, I would request all the participants to maintain the COVID regulations and then uh, maintain the spare social distance and then take care of your personal health for the community safe and for our people and for our society. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, and with this, Rihar Kumar signing off for this uh, from this training program. Thank you. Thank you all.